When I started making games almost exactly a year ago, I began the same way I imagine many aspiring game developers do. I had an exciting idea for something I always wanted to build, I was super inspired by someone else's project, and I wanted to get right to work. But before I did, I googled something to the effect of how to get started with game dev. Now that query can take you down quite a few rabbit holes, but among the most consistent pieces of advice I saw was the recommendation to start small. So I did. I worked on three projects last year, two of which I completed and released. So, why am I telling you this? Mainly because I think it was really good advice. I've learned so much over the past year that I could never hope to describe in one video, and I gained experience designing, implementing, and actually releasing projects, which is a great feeling. More importantly though, it's made me feel ready. Ready to go back to that exciting idea that set me down this path in the first place. Am I actually ready though? Hmm, I kinda doubt it. The idea I have for this game in my head is just really big, and if I do end up finishing it, it's probably gonna take me years. That said, that doesn't really scare me though. At the end of the day, I'm still gonna be learning, growing my potential, and making games, which is why I'm doing this in the first place, because I enjoy it. So, with all those things said, we're gonna do it. This is the beginning of the devlog series for Dauphin, a game about a marine biologist and the ocean he's trying to save. Inspired by a true story. Hey everyone, it's just after 5 o'clock on Tuesday, February 4th. I just got home from work, and I think today's going to be the day where we kick off development of Dauphin. Or at least officially kick off development. I have so far worked on this little mock title screen with this one piece of artwork and a few animations, just so I have something to show off when I first post about the game. This is all, of course, very much a work in progress, but for now I think it's better than nothing. But before we jump into development, I want to talk about this. This little prototype is the result of me getting really excited about developing Dauphin sometime towards the end of last year and working on this when I probably should have been working on Polar. Now, what you see here is me just trying to flesh out whether or not I really want to go down this particular path for movement and exploration and basic melee combat. And honestly, I think it turned out pretty well. I've actually built out a couple cool things here. You can see that you can move in all directions using WASD and you attack with your little stick by clicking the mouse. But where you attack is based on the position of the mouse, so you can be moving to the right and attack to the left. I guess kind of like twin stick combat is what you could call this. I've also got health bars over the enemies, uh, exploding enemies when you kill them, and of course health for the player which is up in the top left and kind of looking like something from Zelda. Apart from that I just have basic collisions with the environment, and that's kind of all that exists here in this prototype. There is one interesting tidbit about this project that may surprise you, and that is that I did not build this with Unity, I actually built it with Godot. If you haven't heard about Godot, I'd strongly recommend going to check out their website. It is a totally free, open source, 2D and 3D game engine that's very much up and coming right now. They have a dedicated team of developers who have been working to build some really exciting features for it, and I was really excited to use it. It's been on my radar for a while, and it will definitely continue to be as it grows. It was really a treat to build out this prototype with Godot, and I was honestly surprised by how quickly I was able to do it using their in-house scripting language, which they call GD Script. That said, even though I very much enjoyed working with it, I think I'm going to be sticking with Unity for Dauphin. I certainly plan on making a video to have a more in-depth comparison between the two engines and why I made this decision, but for now I will just say that because Dauphin is such a big project, or it's going to be such a big project, I want to go with what I've been spending the last year of my life learning and learning to make games with, which is of course Unity. I also like C Sharp better than GD Script, and I know that Godot has support for C Sharp, but it's just not really where I want it to be right now. So I'm happy with Unity, also really happy with Godot, but I think Unity is going to be a better fit for this project. But enough of that, this video is probably like five minutes long already, and we haven't even started development yet, so let's do it. Here's my very basic, alarmingly sparse Trello board so far for Dauphin. Now, there's not a lot of tasks here because I've captured a lot of ideas on my iPad and in a notebook that I just need to port over. But for now, I've got enough to work with, and I'm going to start out just kind of trying to recreate what I did so far in the prototype in Godot, having a basic stage that's built out with tile maps and a basic player character that can navigate that stage. The good news is I already have this nice little grassland tile set that I created for that prototype, so I'll just be exporting this from Asprite, importing the PNG into Unity, and creating my prototype stage. Let's do it. This 
doesn't look too bad, but it's gonna look way better once I get the trees and bushes from my previous prototype into the project. So I'm gonna go ahead and import those, create some prefabs and spruce up the scene a bit. I spent a few minutes getting my bushes and trees imported into the scene and it looks way better. I think the shadows, especially underneath the trees and bushes, add a lot of depth to this scene that was completely missing when all we had was the grass and the little bushes and the mushrooms. You can look at my scene hierarchy over here on the left to see how I put this stuff together. I've got a game object called foliage, which is just an empty game object, and if I expand that you can see all the trees and bushes exist as children. You'll also notice that these objects are blue, meaning that they're prefabs, not just me dragging the sprite out into the scene and having Unity create a game object that has a sprite render. This was pretty intentional on my part. We're gonna to want to add quite a bit of components and functionality to these trees so that the player can interact with them as he explores the scene. But I think I'll be saving that for tomorrow. It's about 7.30 now and I've been working on either the video or this prototype so far since I got home. Time to grab some dinner and relax. We'll catch up first thing tomorrow morning. Good morning folks, it is 5.45 a.m. on Wednesday morning. I would say I'm up bright and early, but it's actually pitch dark outside and probably will be for the next few hours. Anyway, I'm gonna pick up this morning where I left off yesterday, changing gears a little bit. I wanna work on the player and giving him the tools he needs to explore the little scene we created last night. It's going on 6.30 now and happy to report that I've got the beginnings of our player object as you can see in the scene here. If I go ahead and hit play, you'll see that it's pretty simple so far, just an object with a sprite renderer, a rigid body 2D, and a player controller script that's allowing me to move him around. The interesting part about this player though is that I'm using Unity's new input system, which is in preview version 1.0 as of Unity 2019.3. I definitely plan to create a tutorial on this new input system in the next few weeks since I found it quite a bit different than the way I was previously capturing input in Unity. For now though, I'll just give you a quick walkthrough of how I set this up. To get started, go and grab the input system package from the package manager. Go ahead and open package manager, show preview packages by clicking on the advanced tab and then grab the input system preview package. Once you have that installed, you can create your first input actions asset. This is an asset that will allow you to define actions and the controls that will trigger those actions. To do that, go ahead into your project explorer, right click, create, and at the bottom you should have a new option for input actions. Here's what you see when you open that asset up. Just a new window where you can create action maps and actions for those maps. You can see I've created one map here for the player and one action for the player, which is called move. If I go ahead and open that up, you can see all the controls that I want to trigger this action. Of course, the left stick on the gamepad, WASD, and the arrow keys on the keyboard, and joysticks on various types of controllers. Also worth noting is that you can set the control type on the action itself. So in this case, I want all of these controls for this action to report a vector2 value because that's how I want my movement to work in my game. Once you're happy with how your controls are set up, you can go ahead and click Save Asset at the top and close that out. You kind of have two options moving forward though. Unity provides a component that you can attach to your player that will allow you to hook up those actions from your new assets to callbacks in your scripts. I, however, am more of a code-oriented person, so I chose to use the kind of scripting approach. To do that, you can click on your newly created asset in your Project Explorer, and in the Inspector, there's an option to generate a C-sharp class. I went ahead and checked that box and clicked Apply. This generates a C-sharp class based on whatever I named my input actions asset, in my case, player input actions. This will just allow me to capture input directly from my scripts rather than requiring me to hook it up from the editor. At this point, it's super easy to interact with your actions and your script. You can see in Awake, the first thing I do is create a new instance of my player input actions and store a reference to it. Then in on enable, I enable these actions because I created them programmatically. Finally, in update, I'm pulling for input as I normally would. I've created this little function to kind of nicely wrap that up. The most important part of this is this particular line right here. I'm taking my reference to my player input actions, calling the particular action map, which is player in my case, the action that I want to look at, which is move, and then calling read value for the control type that I set on that action, which is a vector two. 
This provides me with a reference to the vector that's being output by whatever control I'm inputting. At that point, I can pass this vector into whatever logic I want to use to actually move my character, and we're ready to go. I think the obvious benefits of this system are being able to map so many controls to a single action. This way, I can just support so many different devices rather than just checking if the W key is pressed to move upwards. Now, that was a very quick walkthrough. I'll definitely be doing a tutorial, but hopefully that was enough to get you started if you're interested in the new input system. All right, I was gonna keep moving forward and implement some animations for the player, but I am super behind on editing this week's video and I wanna have it out by Sunday. So I think I'm just gonna grab another cup of coffee, change gears and work on the video for the rest of the morning. Definitely have more work to do on the player, so we will catch up next time I sit down to make some more progress. Good morning everyone, it is almost 7 a.m. on Friday morning, back after a couple really busy days where I just didn't have any time at all to work on Dolphin, but I'm hoping to make some progress this morning before I head off to work. So picking up where I left off earlier this week, I'd really like to keep extending the player's functionality so that there's more he can do as he explores the scene. You may remember when I was working on Polar that I implemented what I thought was a pretty good system for managing player state. I still think that's a good solution, so what I'm gonna work on this morning is porting that code over and applying it to my player here in Dolphin. All right, it's about 7.30 now and I've got the new state machine stuff hooked up, or I should say the old state machine stuff. The gameplay doesn't look any different, but if you look over here in my player controller, you can see some familiar code. I've got a request state function, which decides whether or not the state machine is allowed to change states based on the state you've requested. And then I've got two states defined here, one for idle and one for move. This is actually pretty nice. I was having trouble figuring out exactly where I wanted to put my movement code before because I didn't really have a good place to organize it. But now it's got a home right here inside the move state and execute physics, which is great. Now that I've got that done, I think I'm going to move on to trying to hook up the animation to this move state. Alright, it is going on 8 o'clock now, almost time to get ready for work, but before I do that, I want to show you guys the animations that I've hooked up. If I go ahead and hit play here, you can see that once I start moving, we start that walking animation that I have created before. If we turn left, the sprite face is left, and overall I think this looks pretty good. Of course, when we come to a stop, we revert back to our idle state and play our idle animation, which right now is really just standing still. This was pretty easy to accomplish, but I did come up with one implementation detail to help myself transition between animations, so I'll go ahead and show you that now. All right, so if you've worked with animations in Unity before, you know that there's this concept of the animator, which is basically a state machine that allows you to define states, associate them with animations, and then create transitions between those states. You guys know I like to do my own state management in the code, so I don't really take advantage of all this. What I do still need to do is create states and associate them with animations, and then call animator.play and pass in the name of that state when I want to play the animation. Now, I don't really like calling functions with strings as parameters like this, because if I get the string wrong, it's just not gonna work. So I came up with something in my code to make this a little bit cleaner. To prevent the use of raw strings in my code when I'm kicking off these animations, I created a separate static class called player animations outside of my player controller. The only things in here are some constant strings that match up to the names of the animation states in the animator. Now the way I use this is down in state management. When I'm calling my wrapper function that calls the animation on the animator, Rather than passing in a raw string, I'm just passing in playeranimations.walk or playeranimations.idle. This will help prevent any future defects if I were ever to type in walk or idle or any other future states and have a typo. I know this is not like a huge concept worth writing home about, but I still think this is a nice tip for some of you who like to clean up their code. All right, it's definitely time for me to wrap this up and get to work for now. Hopefully we'll have another session sometime this weekend to wrap up this first devlog. I'll see you then. Hey everyone, it is Saturday afternoon now. I've been sitting here editing this video and I've realized now that it has gone on long enough for the first devlog in the series. I wanted to thank you guys for watching and also thank you for a pretty big milestone we hit today which was 40,000 subscribers. It still blows my mind that that many people enjoy following my work on YouTube. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video today and I hope that the tutorials I threw in there were helpful. As always, leave a comment below if you liked or disliked that kind of content. Happy to go either way in my future videos.
Thanks a bunch for watching. Don't forget to like if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.